Jennifer Dulos vanished five years ago. The trial into her husband's mistress has recently begun. With her husband unable to stand trial, this may be the only justice given to this still missing, but legally declared dead, mother of five. You are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna and today we are going to be going over the key moments throughout this trial. I have tried to compile hours of testimonies, interrogation footage, court footage to bring you the most important evidence, the bombshell statements that have been made throughout the trial, the information that we didn't previously know about Jennifer Dulos, her family, and the actual disappearance. So I'm going to do a brief recap of of Jennifer's disappearance if you haven't already heard it. However, I will put a timestamp on the trial if you just want to go ahead and skip to that. And this trial is still ongoing. It's going to be about a six to eight week trial is what they believe. And we're on week five. So if you would like to subscribe, I will go ahead and keep you updated on the rest of the trial, the sentencing phase, and all that is to come. So let's get into the story. So it was back in 2019 on May 24th and 50 year old Jennifer Delos, she had taken her five children to school. She had dropped them off at their new Canaan country school in Canaan, Connecticut. She had two sets of twins who were Petros and Theodore and then Rashawn and Constantine and then they had Noel. But after dropping her children off that day, she was not seen again. Now by that evening, Jennifer would be reported missing by her friends and her concerned nanny. You see, the Duloses had a nanny who was named Named Lauren Almeda and she had arrived at the home around 1130 in the morning for work. This is her normal time of arriving and she noticed that Jennifer's Range Rover was still in the garage. Now Jennifer had two vehicles and this was strange that the Range Rover was still there and Jennifer had taken her Suburban considering that she had told Lauren the previous day she was going to be taking the Range Rover to her doctor's appointment that had begun at 11. Now this was all the way in New York City so she would have to drive a bit and she said it was hard to park the Suburban so she wanted to take the Range Rover. Now Jennifer was not inside the home when the nanny went inside to look for her and her Chevrolet Suburban wasn't in the garage. So Lauren assumed she had taken the Suburban to the appointment even though she had previously stated otherwise. However, Jennifer still didn't return home after her one o'clock appointment. She had one at 11 and one at one and she still didn't return home as scheduled. Upon further investigation, the nanny would find that the doctor's appointments that Jennifer had that day weren't attended by anyone. And friends who were trying to get in contact with her were failing to do so. And everyone who knew her claimed that she would not have just left without telling people where she was going. I mean, she had five kids to take care of. Jennifer's neighbor then found a sighting of her vehicle on their surveillance footage as she was returning home from dropping off the kids at school. So this was around 8.05 in the morning. She was in her black 2017 Chevrolet Suburban. However, the same footage would show the same vehicle a few hours later at 1025 leaving the residence. However, it could not be confirmed that Jennifer was the one driving. When the new K9 police arrived at Jennifer's home, they found bike tire marks outside of the residence and in the kitchen on the faucet, blood was found. In the garage, there were multiple sections of blood found. There were blood stains, blood splatter. On the floor, the door, the walls, as well as the exterior of the Range Rover that was still parked inside. Investigators were concluding that Jennifer had suffered a serious physical assault in this home. Now, DNA tests of the blood would come back as confirming that they belong to Jennifer, except for the blood on the kitchen faucet. Now the kitchen faucet was a mixture of a male and a female, and this belonged to Jennifer and her estranged husband, Fotis. You see, at the time, Jennifer and Fotis were not living together, so investigators then went to Fotis's home which was $5 million in Farmington, where he once had shared this with Jennifer and the kids. They searched this home, but nothing was found. And that is when the Chevrolet Suburban that Jennifer was thought to have been driving that day was located. This was on the side of the road in Waveney Park in New Canaan. This was only three miles from her home. And so after this, the police began to search the park for her remains. Helicopters and canine units were brought in to help, but they were not finding anything. 
but Jennifer, she wasn't originally born a Dulos. She had gotten married to Fotis Dulos in 2004 and they were together for the next 13 years, having five children. Fotis owned a construction company called Four Group, building luxury homes, and Jennifer would stay home with the children while also working on her writing that she loved to do. The family did very well for themselves. Jennifer came from a wealthy family, but this family themselves were not by any means struggling. But this did mean that Fotis was always working. He was always taking trips outside of the home. The kids rarely saw him. Jennifer rarely saw him. After 13 years though, it became quite drastic, the change and the dynamics of the family. You see, in 2017, they were going through divorce proceedings and that is when Jennifer would file for an emergency order for full custody of all five of the children. She claimed that Fotis was now showing irrational, unsafe, bullying, threatening, and controlling behavior, that he had threatened to kidnap the children if she did not agree to the terms of the divorce. She also mentioned that he had bought a gun, which alarmed her. Now, the next month, Jennifer was saying that Fotis got really enraged with her for scheduling activities for the kids and basically had this huge fit where he chased after her up the stairs, trapped her inside of a room, and verbally attacked her and physically intimidated her. Now, Jennifer told this court that we're going through the divorce proceedings and when she was trying to get custody, I'm afraid of my husband. I know that filing for divorce and filing this motion will enrage him. I know he will retaliate by trying to harm me in some way. Now, Fotis's response was that he wasn't threatening or attacking anyone, especially his wife, and that his gun was bought just simply for home security. He claimed, though, that Jennifer was the one telling their children that he didn't care about them and that she was going to make sure that the divorce was elongated and that she knew the mafia and that she could get them to break the children's dad's legs with a baseball bat. And she was telling all of this to the children. Fotis said that Jennifer had called him a psychopath. However, she denied this, the same as Fotis denied her claims, and instead the court granted the couple shared custody. So Jennifer then moved out of their shared home in Farmington to a rental home in New Canaan without Fotis. So Fotis stayed in their family home, and that is when his girlfriend and her daughter who was a 10 year old at this time named Nicole moved in. So his girlfriend, Michelle, was then living at that family home. And by 2019, that divorce was still not finalized when Jennifer Delos vanished. Now, a lot more information will come out in the trial testimonies, but before we get there, let's go into a little bit of the information that investigators had found prior to the arrests that were made. So after the disappearance of Jennifer, surveillance footage was found of a man and a woman dumping garbage bags into different dumpsters in Hartford. The woman was sat in the passenger seat, appeared to be talking on the phone while the man was throwing different garbage bags away. Now this actually happened the evening of Jennifer's disappearance around 7.30 p.m., around the same time that her friends had reported her missing. Now, investigators headed to Hartford to examine what was in these dumpsters, what was in these trash bags, and that is when they would find bloodied clothes as well as bloodstained sponges and different methods of cleaning supplies. DNA tests of this blood would match Jennifer Delos. However, DNA inside of a glove that had been thrown away was tested and found to be a match to Fotis. Investigators believed that they were looking at Fotis Delos and his new girlfriend, Michelle Traconis, in the surveillance footage. Still, Jennifer had not been located or heard from. Her cell phone records as well as credit cards showed no more activity after that morning of May 24th. And by the next month in June 2019, ex-husband Fotis Delos was arrested and charged with tampering with or fabricating physical evidence and hindering prosecution. At the same time, his live-in girlfriend, Michelle Traconis, a 44-year-old, was also arrested on the same charges. It was believed that they were the people in that surveillance footage dumping the trash bags that were found to have blood of Jennifer on them, but they couldn't quite connect them to murder just yet. 
Now, around the time of these arrests, an investigative reporter named Dave Altamardi for the Connecticut Mirror was going around trying to find all of the evidence in the trash bags. And he would find that a homeless man had originally found these bags while the investigators were still searching, one of which had a bloody pillow inside. He said that this bloody pillow was still wet with blood and that there was also a knife inside. Now, once this investigative reporter found this homeless man, the homeless man said he had sold the knife to a man named Fudge for some money. So Fudge was found and he said he sold it for food, but he didn't know to who or to how to get in contact with them again. So at that point, investigators were unable to locate what they believed could be the murder weapon. On June 11th, Fotis adamantly denied he did not kill his wife and he didn't know where she was. And Michelle claimed the same. So eventually, by both pleading not guilty, they made bail and they were released. And by June 26th, Fotis actually made a statement to the Stanford Superior Court saying, the public's perception of me as a monster, given the little they know about this case, but I trust the system and the process and ask the public to do the same. My children are the center of my world. I worry about them and Jennifer, and I would tell them that I know it is hard now, but everything is going to be all right eventually. I believe I have been and will continue to be treated fairly by the criminal justice system. Please keep my children and Jennifer in your thoughts. At this point, their five children were given to their maternal grandmother who was given full temporary custody. They were between eight years old and 13 years old at this time and had to move from New Canaan to New York City to be with her. And this is when it was found that a friend of Fotis's and his former lawyer named Kent Mawinney had actually been accused by his estranged wife of spousal rape. His wife had gone to the police around this time saying that she feared her husband husband Kent and his friend Fotis were trying to kill her. Then in August 2019, investigators found a grave on a secluded property owned by Kent Mawinney. And it was filled with two bags of lime and a blue tarp, but no body. Three months later in September, both Fotis and Michelle were arrested again for another charge of tampering with evidence. And again, they pled not guilty. And the next month, Fotis went to court to seek dismissal of all of the charges. Now, the judge did agree to review everything. And around this time, Fotis's girlfriend, Michelle Traconis, and her daughter was said to move out of Fotis's home. Then on January 7th of 2020, eight months since Jennifer had last been seen, the Connecticut State Police arrived at the home of Fotis Delos and charged him with capital murder and kidnapping. Investigators believed that Jennifer had been killed at her home the day she vanished. They believed that she was bound with zip ties, put inside her own car while her ex-husband cleaned the garage, and they drove them both away from the home in her vehicle. Fotis immediately pled not guilty, and his bond was set at $6 million. Now, his estranged girlfriend, Michelle Draconis, was also charged with conspiracy to commit murder. However, so was a friend of Fotis's, the man who was also his attorney at one time, Kent Mawinney, the man who was also found to have a grave in his yard. Both also pled not guilty. They had all been granted bail and would return home. And on January 28th, there was an emergency bail hearing and so Fotis was supposed to show up at the court, however, he did not. Investigators rushed to the Farmington home where he lived and they would peer through the garage window to see him lying on the ground. Once they got inside, they found Fotis unresponsive and tried CPR but were unsuccessful, so they rushed him to a hospital in critical condition and doctors quickly realized that this was carbon monoxide poisoning. He had run a vacuum cleaner hose from the exhaust pipe of his SUV through the inside of the car. He had tried to take his own life. So his children were able to visit him while he was on life support, but two days later, he would pass away. His lawyer would later come forward saying that this was a suicide and that there was a suicide note left where Fotis said, I refuse to spend even an hour more in jail for something I had nothing to do with. I want it to be known that Michelle Draconis had nothing to do with Jennifer's disappearance and neither did Ken Moeni. So their number one suspect in Jennifer's disappearance was now deceased without giving any more information about her whereabouts. 
But Fotis was said to have a new girlfriend at this time because Michelle and her daughter had moved out of the house. So this was a woman named Anna Curry. And she said she was actually at the home that morning and they were supposed to go to the bail hearing together. However, Fotis said that he wanted to drive to the courthouse separately. So as she was driving there, his lawyer called her asking where he was and she claimed he was on his way. And he said, no, his tracking data shows he's still at the home. And that's when she told him to call 911. Two months later, on March 3rd, 2020, prosecutors requested that the murder charges against Fotis be dismissed. A judge then acknowledged that the case could not continue, but it wasn't technically an acquittal of Fotis. However, Fotis's lawyer didn't agree with this. He said that he wanted to clear Fotis's name and continue the case. He said that Fotis was framed. He said that the items that Fotis and Michelle were seen dumping had actually been dumped on their front porch of Jennifer's bloody clothing, and they were just trying to get rid of it. At this time, Michelle and Ken's charges remained, and Michelle was under house arrest, and she said, to those who are quick to judge people they do not know, let me say this, it is possible to misjudge others. Whether or not Fotis Delos was capable of doing the things that police and prosecutors accused him of doing, I do not know. But based on what I've learned in the last year, I think it was a mistake to have trusted him. Kent was being held on a $2 million bail, but was let out on reduced bail in October of 2020. And then in 2021, Jennifer's law was passed in Connecticut, which made a domestic violence bill that included coercive control. Now, this meant that behavior which causes fear or harm or rejects freedom of action is also domestic abuse. This was not only for Jennifer Dulos, but also Jennifer Magnano, who was murdered back in 2007 by her husband, who then also committed suicide before being sentenced. By October 2023, four years since Jennifer's disappearance, she was legally declared dead. And investigators believe that Fotis had left his phone at his home that day and was lying in wait at Jennifer's home when she arrived. But now, the only justice that could be given was on the shoulders of the prosecution for Michelle and Kent. So this is when the trial would begin. So much information and testimonies have been revealed throughout this trial, so we are going to go from week to week and discuss them. So week one, it was January 11th, or very recently, the trial for Michelle Traconis began. So her lawyer was arguing that Jennifer should be referred to as an alleged victim, considering this wasn't a murder trial for Michelle. Michelle was not on trial for murder. In fact, her lawyer said that the luminol spray that was sprayed in Jennifer's home and in her car only showed small amounts of blood and that some of it that was shown could have just been bleach or rust that can show up as blood. But this trial was to see if Michelle Traconis had anything to do with Jennifer's disappearance, with the cover-up, if she tampered with evidence, if she knew what they were getting rid of in that surveillance footage, how much she actually knew, and if she knew where Jennifer was located. So the family nanny, Lauren Almeida, would testify that Jennifer was someone that she looked up to. She was a role model. She had begun working for this family back in 2012 as a babysitter, and the next year she was a full nanny. She was also helping out with Fotis's company, The Four Group, as well. She said that Fotis had taught her so much, encouraged her to go back to school, get her real estate license, and was teaching her as they worked together. During the summers, though, Lauren would mainly be with the children due to the fact that they were out of school, and she said that during that time, Jennifer was always there with her and she was extremely nurturing with her kids. She never raised her voice at them. They always wanted to be next to mommy. It was just kind of what it was. And she would sing to them and laugh at them and she never raised her voice. So she was saying that Jennifer was her boss, but at the same time, they also had this connection and they really trusted each other. Lauren then said that there was a trip that occurred around March of 2017, right before the divorce proceedings. The whole family went to Colorado and Fotis happily told Jennifer and Lauren that he had gotten their five kids, their young five kids, into a club. He was very happy about this. Lauren said it was very odd, but nobody really said much and they just moved on. But during this time is when Jennifer told Lauren that she believed Fotis was having an affair, but she didn't have any proof. Lauren heard this, but said she didn't believe that Fotis would do that to their five children. The big dynamic change was in 
March of 2017, which is when Jennifer found out about his affair. This is when Lauren claimed that Jennifer really started to confide in her about their marriage. And Lauren says she did notice that Fotis was kind of hash and Jennifer was one who didn't like the conflict at all. So that is when from Colorado, that trip, they had gone to Miami as a family. And Lauren said that in Miami, she noticed that Jennifer was often with their youngest child who couldn't do much. They were in a jet ski lodge basically. And so the youngest couldn't do much. So Jennifer would stay in the hotel with her as well as Jennifer's mother. She was there as well. And then Lauren would go with Fotis and the other children to actually do the activities, to go out throughout the day. And that is when Lauren admitted to the courtroom that she had met Michelle Draconis. It was during this March 2017 trip. She was introduced to Michelle by Fotis as a friend, but some of the kids already seemed to know her and her daughter. But Lauren did notice that whenever Michelle was with Fotis and the family, Jennifer was never there. Then during this Miami trip, Lauren said that Jennifer had to rush her mother home because she had broken her ankle. And so Jennifer took her mother home while Lauren stayed with the kids and Fotis and Michelle and her daughter. And that is when Lauren said that Fotis actually told them they couldn't stay in the ski lodge anymore. So he booked a hotel room, one room for Lauren and the five children. And Fotis said he was gonna go stay with a friend. So Lauren thought that was very odd, but they all returned home after this. And that is when Jennifer would tell Lauren that she knew that Fotis was cheating and she had proof. The next day, Lauren said Jennifer had come up to her and said that she had confronted Fotis about this affair. He admitted to it, but that they were going to be as civil as they possibly could for the children. However, Jennifer did ask Lauren if she were to move, if Lauren would come with her and take care of the kids for her. And she did agree to this, saying she would even quit her job with Fotis at Four Group to do so. But everything changed when the divorce proceedings actually began and Fotis knew what was happening. Lauren said it was very uncomfortable to be in the presence of both Jennifer and Fotis, that they were always fighting. And once she claimed she arrived at the home to see Fotis chasing Jennifer with a piece of paper through the garage, and then they act like nothing had happened when she walked into the house. And that is when Jennifer began to tell Lauren she wanted to move out. She needed to do so quietly. Because at one point, Lauren was in one of the rooms playing with the children and she would hear screaming begin. And then Jennifer would actually run into their room, not knowing they were in there and barricade the door. And Fotis was just absolutely going crazy at the door, trying to get inside. And when Jennifer realized that Lauren and the children were there, she was protecting the door even more. But then when Fotis got inside and realized they were there, his whole demeanor changed. So by June of 2017, they officially left while Fotis was away from the home to get away from him secretly and as quietly as they could. But Lauren said that they went to stay in a hotel and Jennifer was so afraid that she actually hired a armed bodyguard to stand outside of the hotel room while they were moving. Lauren had said that she had verbally heard Fotis threaten to take the kids to Greece where he was from and to never bring them back. Lauren testified that she was involved in their custody case from the beginning and that during all of the hearings, she was speaking out for Jennifer to get custody and Fotis would come up to her and begin screaming at her about kidnapping his kids since they had left the home without his knowledge. She would then be the one to sometimes drop off the kids for visitation after these two were getting shared custody. And she would say that Fotis would continue to yell at her in front of the children to the point where she said she could no longer drop them off anymore. She wanted nothing to do with Fotis. But this is when the custody arrangement fell into supervised visitation for Fotis and full custody for Jennifer. And so Fotis would actually have to come over to Jennifer's home to see his children with a social worker of some sort to make sure that everything would go smoothly. So two days before Jennifer's disappearance, Lauren said that Fotis had one of his supervised visitation with the kids. It was always at 4.30 p.m. However, he arrived 30 minutes early, which Lauren said was not like him at all. He was pretty late most of the time. And according to the agreement for these visitations, he was supposed to wait at the base of their driveway and wait for the social worker so they could drive up together. However, that day, he had come up to the home 
all alone and, and didn't announce himself to anybody. And when Jennifer went to talk to him about this, Lauren said he allegedly claimed he was just confused and he drove back down. Now, interestingly enough, Lauren would testify that the day prior to Jennifer's disappearance, she would go down to the basement to get a whole pack of towels, paper towels, for the kitchen. And this was something that was part of her job. And that's when she and Jennifer had talked about the appointments in New York City, that she was going to take the Range Rover and that Lauren was gonna pick up the kids from school because they had a half day that day and bring them to Jennifer in the city so that they could go to the dentist as well. So they were having this conversation. She was setting up the paper towels. Everything was pretty normal until the day of Jennifer's disappearance. And so on May 24th of 2019, Lauren said that she texted with Jennifer early that morning around the time that Jennifer was dropping off the kids. They were just discussing the kids basically saying that one of the children had gotten in trouble for being on Instagram but now she was allowing him to be on Instagram and so they were just discussing little things like that and so Lauren would head to work in the late morning hours. She would grab Subway for lunch for the kids and then she would head to pick up the kids because it was a half day. And when she went into the home, she found that the Range Rover was still there. That's the first unusual thing she noticed. But then she testified that she had seen Jennifer's purse on the floor. Now, this was a, a very nice purse. And she thought maybe she was just in a rush and had grabbed her phone in her wallet and went. But then she noticed on the counter Jennifer's tea and her granola bar that she had every single morning. She finished it every day. Her tea was full. Her granola bar was untouched. So she put this away, but noted it as odd. Then when she went to go get more paper towels because the one in the kitchen was empty already, she found that there were only two paper towel rolls from the whole pack that she had brought up the day prior. So she thought that this was very strange. Maybe there was a spill. She didn't really know. So she headed to pick up the kids. Then she was heading to New York City to meet up with Jennifer, but realized Jennifer was no longer answering her texts. So after this, Lauren was contacting Fotis about Jennifer being missing. And she claimed that Fotis really wasn't talking much about Jennifer. He was only really interested in talking about his next supervised visit with the children. And then two days after Jennifer vanished, Fotis showed up at Jennifer's mother's home where Lauren was with the kids and they ended up calling the police on him. So that was basically the key moments in Lauren Almeida's testimony, the nanny who had seen the most being in that home, being with these parents for many, many years. And so Lauren was stepped down from the stand and that is when forensic science examiner Kristen Maddell testified about the DNA and the fact that the blood in the garage tested as a single female. However, the sample from the faucet had a mix of two DNA profiles, one being a man. Then police sergeant Kenneth Venstretta came to the stand to testify and he wanted to talk about the days following Jennifer's disappearance and how they were looking into Fotis' employees from Four Group and in fact what cars they had because they believed that during this time Fotis and possibly Michelle had been using a different car than their own. So that was the key points for week one of the trial. And then week two began and another police sergeant named Kevin Duggan testified of exactly what they found in those dumpsters. When investigators had found the other bags that the homeless man hadn't found, they had two shirts, zip ties, a clear poncho, a bath towel, a broken razor blade, a bra and gloves, all with blood like substances on them. And then they also found a bent broom or mop handle, sponges, a screwdriver, and keys. And the clothes matched what Jennifer was last seen wearing. This is when the courtroom would hear about Michelle Traconis' interview with investigators. This occurred on June 2nd, 2019, eight days after Jennifer's disappearance. And she was speaking English to the investigators and seemed to have no problem during the interrogation. However, during the trial, she was listening via a Spanish interpreter, which some did think was quite weird. So in this interview that Michelle had, her first interview, she said that she had proof of her alibi of where she was that morning, but that she would help in the investigation. She gave a timeline of what happened saying that she had seen photos that morning. However, her stories began to change the more they interviewed her. And she then asked police if Fotis had used her 
and they told her that he was very calculated. Now, Michelle appeared quite surprised when investigators told her that the evidence from the trash bags that they were seen dumping was found to be a match to Jennifer. She claimed that they were just in the area for her daughter's French lessons. She was promised that they would go to Starbucks and she did not know what Fotis had been throwing out. When the police were pushing her on the fact that Fotis had killed Jennifer and Michelle needed to let them know where she was, she asked, did you look in the house? She then told them about all his different properties, the ones that he owned, the ones that he worked with through the four group, and about his Tacoma truck, which he sometimes drove for work that did not belong to him. But she did appear to dodge the question of when was the last time she saw Fotis that day and if he had changed his clothes. Her second interview was then shown to the courtroom and she had brought maps she had drawn of the properties and offered to help. She was much more emotional in this one. She said that she would go out with them and actually search the properties and she began to cry into her hands at one point saying that she was probably the most hated woman in America. By the third interview, investigators began to see the inconsistencies in her story she was then saying she didn't see photos all morning. I don't want to hear who was involved in her murder. I don't know. Are you sure that photos was there that morning? When you woke up? Well, I slept with me going, so I believe he was, but now that you tell me he wasn't, he wasn't. Did you see him that morning? No, I did not see him. And then after Michelle's interviews were shown, evidence was brought in to show the jury notes, handwritten notes written by Fotis and Michelle of them plotting out what they were going to say as their timeline. These were found in Fotis's home. Michelle said that she started the day by taking a shower with Fotis. She then took her daughter to school and she even wrote about what she was wearing that day. There was also another note that was a list of calls from her phone that day of the disappearance. Now investigators were calling these alibi scripts that they had written up so that they could tell the police. However, in court, they allowed them to be called timelines instead. Then the next witness was brought in to testify. This was Sergeant Michael Buten, who would say that he had spoken to one of Fotis's employees not long after the disappearance and that he was quite suspicious. The sergeant said that this man's shirt was soaked in sweat. He was out of breath for no reason. This was an employee named Pavel Gumieni, and he seemed overly nervous to this investigator. This employee was also said to be the owner of the vehicle that Fotis was said to be driving that day, the Tacoma. Week two came to an end and week three of the trial began. A state forensic expert testified about the items in the dumpsters that were all bloody and also said that it was possible that Michelle and Fotis's DNA were both on the trash bag. However, it was a small amount, so this was only a partial DNA match to Michelle. Jennifer's DNA had also been found in the seat of the Tacoma truck once they had seized it as evidence. It was then revealed in the courtroom that the vehicle Fotis was believed to be using that day was a red Toyota Tacoma that belonged to his employee named Pavel. Investigators actually backtracked the movement on the morning of the disappearance connected to this Tacoma and they found that it had gone towards New Canaan, where Jennifer lived, that morning and then headed back away from New Canaan later that morning. The truck was seen on CCTV rest stops in New Canaan as well as Fairfield. A DNA expert then took the stand, Anita Valonis, and claimed that she had also found samples from a white hard piece of evidence which turned out to be blue-like fiber, which they thought was hair, but wasn't human hair. However, five human hairs had been collected from all of the evidence, including inside of the car that Fotis was said to be driving that day and in the dumpsters. They had found a human hair on the car door panel, on a sponge, on a towel, on a clear plastic bag, and from the knot of a plastic bag. 
footage was then also shown to the jury about the day that the garbage was dumped in this trash can by Fotis and Michelle. They had gone into a Starbucks, like Michelle had said. Both seemed completely calm and normal. And then more footage was shown of Michelle and Fotis actually dumping the garbage. And you could see Michelle appeared to be leaning out of the truck, getting something off the sidewalk, which is how she was seen. But she didn't actually get out to dump anything. Week three came to a close and week four of the trial began and an employee of Fotis' company for group testified. This was Pavel Gumieni, and he was close friends with Fotis and Michelle. He claimed that prior to Jennifer vanishing, he had been with Fotis and Michelle at one point and Fotis was talking about how their family dog was dying and that Jennifer wouldn't let the kids see the dog. And that is when Michelle piped up and said that B should be buried next to the dog. And what did Mr. Dulo say when you asked if Beckham was... He said that Beckham is ill and he's going to have to put him to sleep. And um, he said something like, uh, can you believe that Jennifer won't even let the kids come over and say goodbye to, to the dog before we put him to sleep? Did you respond to that comment? I don't remember. And you indicated that the defendant was present. Did she say anything at that point? Yes. Tell the jury what the defendant said. She said um, the she should be buried right next to this dog. And when you say she, what exactly did she say? Um, can I use bad words? Yes. She said that bitch should be buried right next to this dog. And what was her uh, demeanor like when she said this? I, I think she was um, trying to cheer, cheer Dulos up. He was like heartbroken that, that his dog is about to be put down. How did he react when she said this? I believe he, he just looked at, look at her. Pavel admitted that he had helped Jennifer when she was trying to move away from Fotis very quietly. And this was during the beginning of the divorce, but he had stopped helping because he was afraid he was gonna get fired. But Pavel then told the court shocking information. And this was the fact that he had seen Fotis and Michelle the day that Jennifer vanished together. He was driving Fotis's Ford Raptor during this time and he had left his Tacoma at one of the homes that they were working on. This was the home at 80 Mountain Spring Road. So that day around 5 p.m. he had drove to this home to drop off Fotis's car and get his back. However, when he arrived at the home, he saw both Fotis and Michelle there and they appeared to be very surprised. They explained that they were cleaning the property that day. However, he had never seen Michelle cleaning any other properties. He stated that he had looked over and his keys were in the door of his Tacoma. However, then they needed to go to one of the other homes. So he and Fotis had gone in the Ford Raptor to one of their other homes that they needed to work on. They were there for around 20 minutes and when they returned, the keys were gone. And Fotis would tell him that Michelle had taken the keys, but he shouldn't tell anybody that. Eventually, Michelle came back with the keys and they ended up driving the Tacoma to another one of their work properties at Deer Cliff Road and actually left it there. And then Pavel drove his dirt bike back home. It was very odd. They were shuffling vehicles all day the day of the disappearance, but this is what Pavel said had occurred. Now, Pavel said that later on after the disappearance that he, Michelle, and Fotis were all working on firewood together and that Michelle allegedly said that if Jennifer were to turn up, she would kill her because the media had been using photos of Michelle and her daughter during these media stories and that she was very angry about this. Now, this was specifically noted by the court during cross-examination due to Pavel saying Michelle said that when Jennifer turned up, not if, as though she did not know what occurred or still believed she could return. Pavel then admitted to the court that Fotis had asked him to change out the seats in his Tacoma after that and to use a code word when talking about the seats, calling it hardware. He said that Fotis told him not to go to the police about any of this because he would be arrested and deported. 
So Pavel went to a junkyard, searched for new seats. He wasn't able to find any. So then he used seats from another one of the cars that the company used and switched them out. But he said he decided to keep the Tacoma seats and not get rid of them in case the police ever needed them. This was breaking news in this case. He claimed that around the time of the disappearance, Fotis seemed angry and scared and that Fotis was seen by Pavel trying to figure out if Jennifer's home had cameras. So Pavel said he had gone to the police asking for his Tacoma back after it was seized by evidence. However, he was told he was never getting it back. And since then, Pavel had been granted immunity for his testimony. Now this week was when cell phone data from Fotis's cell phone was revealed to the court and it was found that he had received six messages the day of Jennifer's disappearance from 7.18 a.m. to 1.26 p.m. that day. However, he didn't open any of them until 1.33 p.m. However, there was a call answered around 8.24 a.m. whom Fotis claimed was a friend in Greece when he was still alive. However, during the interrogation, Michelle had mentioned answering that phone call that morning. And so investigators had believed that Fotis had left his phone home that day and actually never had it during the time that he allegedly went to Jennifer's home and murdered her. So on February 8th, 2024, during this trial, prosecutors told the jury that Michelle's DNA was likely found on one of those garbage bags that Fotis was seen tossing into the dumpsters. But her lawyer claimed that since she had been in the truck, she was Fotis's girlfriend at the time. It didn't mean she was involved in this disappearance. Michelle's family at this time were also telling the news that she was responsible, she was thoughtful, she was caring. She was a person who wouldn't harm anybody. It has been a tragedy for us, and I'm sure it's a tragedy for the Farmer family too. But we want this to end and to my daughter to be okay again and to regain our life. So week four came to a close and week five of the trial began after a short break. So this was on February 14th and that's when the jurors were shown new footage. They were shown that five days after Jennifer's disappearance, there was CCTV footage of Michelle and Fotis driving the Tacoma into a car wash and getting it detailed. Footage showed Fotis went inside to do the paperwork, then paid in cash. And when this paperwork was found, it had no name on it, but Fotis' cell phone number, and he had written that the car was a Toyota Sienna, not a Tacoma. At this point, the chief medical examiner was set to testify. However, the defense called hearsay and the testimony was barred. The chief medical examiner had written in the arrest warrants that Jennifer's death was likely due to homicidal violence and that her injuries were not survivable. Then more CCTV footage was shown to the court, this time of a person riding a bike away from Waverly Park that day. This is where Jennifer's car was found. Also, if you remember, bike tracks were found near Jennifer's home. Investigators believed that this was Fotis who used a bike to get to Jennifer's home unnoticed. A neighbor then testified that Fotis had told him that Jennifer was missing and asked him how long he retained his surveillance footage and if he could see it. Then an attorney for the Delos children spoke out claiming that Fotis was very upset learning that his new girlfriend Michelle and her daughter couldn't come to visitations to see his children. The attorney said that Michelle was very saddened by this and wanted to go get coffee with Jennifer to see if she could change her mind. Then, when Jennifer vanished, the attorney said that Fotis called him and said, Hi, Mike, have you heard the news? And this attorney said that the tone was not down or somber, but excited. He had even written down in his notes this attorney had, I don't know what to attribute the tone of voice to. And at the time of this video being filmed, this is how much of the trial has commenced so far. It is ongoing. Like I said, expected to be six to eight weeks. I will keep following along if you want me to keep bringing you updates in the case and the sentencing. Subscribe down below. Give this video a thumbs up. Let me know. And Kent Maweni is still awaiting trial at this time. But do you believe that Michelle is involved in anything? Did she help with the murder? Did she help with the cover-up? Does she know where Jennifer is? Should she be charged? How long should she be sentenced for? One of the biggest questions that will never be taken to court is did Fotis kill his estranged wife? I am so angry that he took his own life before Jennifer could get justice, or at least without giving her whereabouts. 
Was there anything that I didn't include in the trial that you deem important to this case? I tried to pick out the key moments, like I tried to condense it as best as I could while giving you the most important information, but leave down below any information you believe needs to be heard to make a full conclusion. And what else should I include in the part two of the rest of this trial? I can add anything else in. And let me know if you like this type of video where I am discussing the trial as it occurs and kind of giving you more bite-sized information so you're not having to watch six hours of footage per day since this is the, what, the 23rd day of the trial. So I hope that this helps kind of give you the information that you have been looking for, the new evidence in the case, and what do you believe happened to Jennifer Delos? Let me know in the comments below and don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces.